Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to DaVinci Tree's online learning. Uh, this is week three, day one, and I am joined here by our fantastic teacher, Ms. Frusty. Hey, Ms. Frusty. Hi. So, Ms. Frusty is normally our interventionalist, but um, inter in intervention interventionist. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So, Ms. Frusty is normally our interventionist, but as all the third graders know, she's been teaching a lot of your lessons. I mean, she was her teacher before, so that kind of makes sense, right? Um, but today, she's actually here to tell us a joke. You ready? All right. Why do you never see elephants hiding in trees? Why, why Miss Rusty? Why do you never see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're so good at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's legit a joke that I was busted up about before we started filming this. I like that because they're so good at it. Uh, can you imagine looking up and there's just this... <laughs> This really foreboding shadow and anyway. All right, let's go ahead and get to the pledge today. Uh, let's see here, ladies and gentlemen, go ahead and stand at attention. Miss Trucy, take it away. Yes, please take off your hats and hoodies and face a flag in your area or look at the one on the screen. Put your right hand over your heart. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, Mr. I'm still imagining a tree. But anyway, okay. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, have a fantastic day back. Uh, again, uh, third week. We can do this, guys. We'll see you on the internet. Bye. Okay, I think this is going. Uh, so uh, today is week three, day one. And this is actually coming out a day late. I want to apologize to everybody. I know uh, like Riley, Noah, and a couple other people, I think Joey, uh, were all checking for this video and it wasn't up today. I'm really sorry. Uh, I am late. If you are watching this at some point in the future for summer school or if you're not in our school, uh, maybe you don't know, we're making these videos right now during the, the, the stay-at-home lockdown for COVID-19 uh, in April of 2020. Um, I <laughs> Even though it may not seem like it, uh, because you were uh, just finishing week two, day five on Friday, it's been well over a week since I've recorded any lessons. I kind of pre-recorded all the lessons for you guys and then uh, we posted them uh, a little bit earlier or whatever. Uh, um, in the meantime, I've been working on a lot of stuff. We just had a new baby. Uh, baby Molly was just born. I'll have her maybe on the video in a day or two, so that's exciting for me. Uh, we, we've been just super busy with, uh, with the COVID-19 outbreak. We had, to, we had to close down Storybook Cottage. That's been keeping me really busy, filing a bunch of legal paperwork, trying to get some help with that. Stuff like that. So, hope you're doing better. Hope you're keeping a good routine. I know for me, I, I try to set up a schedule for uh, my, my, my boys and my wife and myself. So every day we get up and we have a normal like set of things that we do. Enjoy our coffee in the morning and then we all go outside together for a little while, keeping our distance from everybody else. Things like that. Uh, so I hope you guys are doing the same. Um, I, know, um, I know some of you are looking for more work to do. But I also know that half of you haven't done the work that you're supposed to be doing. So, um, with all of that said, I'm glad to be back. I'm sorry that this is a day late. Let's go ahead and get into it. Okay. So, for our week three, day one agenda, first up, no life skills. So, for this entire week, I'm going to be taking life skills off. These videos are kind of long, uh, as you already know. And we also have, um, again, about half our class needs to catch up on these videos. So we're, we're not going to have any life skills for this entire week to make the video shorter and hopefully help people catch up. Also, today is the only day in week three that we're going to be... Uh, actually, no, I should take that back. Today we're doing literature, but in the days to come, uh, we will have a couple days off of literature, again, just to help people kind of catch up. Okay, so no life skills today and in the coming few days, maybe no literature here. Uh, after no life skills, right after this announcement, we, of course, we have our normal current events. We have our normal U.S. history. 
We'll again have our last day of literature for a few days. We'll be jumping into science, and then of course we have math group one and group two, which takes up a majority of these of these videos. So uh, that's the schedule. That's what we're looking at. Again, the week three videos are going to be a little bit shorter. It'll help people who are a little bit behind to get caught up. It'll also help me because I have a new baby to take care of, and boy, is that a lot of work for those of you who know. Whew. All right. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into our current events. Today for current events, instead of talking about like hard news and economics, I wanted to do something kind of fun. Uh, so first up, we have a message from the Prime Minister of New Zealand. And if you have younger brothers or sisters, this is adorable. Okay, so I hope you're ready for something that is really cute. Uh, before I roll the film, if, uh, if you are not aware, during the lockdown to make sure that we kind of like flatten this this COVID-19 curve, an essential worker is somebody who has to go to work even though everybody's still staying at home. And so the Prime Minister of New Zealand is announcing to all of the children of the world that we consider uh, certain people to be essential workers just to make them happy. And I thought it was adorable. Then we're going to go watch some good news from the Fuse School uh, for some kind of like positive stuff, even though we're in this crazy COVID lockdown. All right, so let's take a look. Boop, 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 play. You'll be pleased to know um, that we do consider both the Tooth Fairy and the Easter Bunny to be essential workers. Um, but as you can imagine at this time, of course, they're going to be um, potentially quite busy at home with, with, their, with their family as well and their own bunnies. And so um, I say to the children of New Zealand, if the Easter bunny doesn't make it to your household, um, then uh, we have to understand that it's a bit difficult at the moment for the bunny to perhaps get everywhere. But um, I have a bit of an idea that maybe in lieu of the bunny being able to make it to your home, you can create your own Easter hunt for all the children in your neighbourhood. So if you're one of those homes that's had a teddy in your front window, um, maybe draw an Easter egg and pop it into your front window and help children in your neighbourhood with their own Easter egg hunt because the Easter Bunny might not get everywhere this year. You'll be pleased to know um, that we do consider both... Isn't that just adorable? I think it's so cute that the Prime Minister of New Zealand is looking out for the kids. Uh, so yeah, if you're looking for that, just uh, you can do a quick Google search for Prime Minister of New Zealand Easter Bunny and uh, Tooth Fairy if you have a little kid in your life and uh, you just want to brighten their day. Because uh, I know for those of us who celebrate Easter, Easter's coming up, it's just around the corner. And uh, of course, little kids are always losing teeth. And so something fun for the little kids in your life if you're stuck at home with any of them. All right, next up, we just have some plain old good news for current events. So I have no idea why that guy had a bag on his head. So that's it for current events today. Quick, easy, light, and fun. All right, so uh, on day uh, five of week two, you received your history test. Now we've only had about four or five history tests turned in. So please make sure if you were in my class that you are filling out the history test and you are sending it in to myself or Mr. Barbero so that you can get credit for that. Okay, so make sure that you turn that in. 
So for today, we are beginning a new phase in, in U.S. history. We just finished the Civil War, and now we're moving on to a phase in history called Reconstruction. Reconstruction was the period of time right after the Civil War was fought, right after Lincoln died. And so to kind of tell the story, okay, um, uh, uh, first, I was going to show you this video in class, but since we're not in class, I can't show it. I can show you a trailer for it. And I will uh, do that in just a minute. But if any of you are interested in history extra credit and you have a parent or guardian that can either rent this movie for you or can buy it for you on like Amazon or iTunes or something like that, uh, I strongly recommend that you watch uh, this, this movie. And I just want to get an email uh, uh, from you with a few paragraphs about what really stood out to you about this movie. The movie is Lincoln by Steven Spielberg, and i got to be honest, I think this movie is a masterpiece. Even though not everything is 100% accurate, the movie is truthful to the time and to the people, even down to the very mannerisms of Lincoln and Seward and Stanton. It really, really captures the character of all of them, okay? And so if you would like to get some extra credit, uh, um, and you can get access to this movie. Please, please watch this movie. And I'm about to show you a trailer. I think I'm allowed to show trailers. I don't think trailers are, I think those are, I don't know. Anyway, if this video gets taken down, please email me. Uh, and even me saying that, you wouldn't know to email me because the video would be taken down. Anyway, let's just watch the trailer. We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. We can't tell our people they can vote yes on abolishing slavery, unless at the same time we can tell them that you're seeking a negotiated peace. It's either the amendment or this Confederate peace. You cannot have both. How many hundreds of thousands have died during your administration? Congress must never declare equal those whom God created unequal. Let the Constitution alone. We are stepped out upon the world stage now with the fate of human dignity in our hands. Blood's been spilled to afford us this moment now, now, now. Abraham Lincoln has asked us to work with him to accomplish the death of slavery. No one's ever been loved so much by the people. Don't. Waste that power. This fight is for the United States of America. Do we choose to be born? Or are we fitted to the times we're born into? Well, I don't know about myself. You may be. settles the fate for all coming time, not only of the millions now in bondage, but of unborn millions to come. Shall we stop this bleeding? seriously a beautiful movie you need to check it out and you can get some extra credit and um gosh just so many things about that like uh like like even when lincoln speaks he speaks with such authority but they even like daniel day lewis he nails that high-pitched voice you know and so they don't uh they don't create like some deep-throated you know like deep voice like oh right you know lincoln's voice oh you know and so uh, they again, they, they they do such a good job, like uh, uh, capturing every every aspect of, of the character. Uh, it's just it's it's gorgeous. Um, so anyway, watch that for extra credit. And uh, for the rest of the week, we are beginning to talk about Reconstruction. All right. So um, after after Lincoln dies, uh, uh, Andrew Johnson uh, becomes president. And now um, when when. When people are running to be president, 
they they will pick somebody that is not like them uh, to run with them and we call that balancing the ticket okay so um the um what was it it was either the 11th or the 12th amendment i forget right now made it so the president and the vice president have to run as a team okay and so when the president of the united states or when the person when the guy uh, usually guy who's running for president is uh is is trying to win uh, uh that person will choose a running mate that pairs well with them and that is is different than them is is opposite from them uh uh, to, to try to, again, create balance uh, for, for them. So, for instance, right, um, you might pick somebody who is different than you geographically, or you might pick somebody who's different than you, like, politically, right? So I'm thinking, uh, for instance, um, back in uh, 2008, okay, uh, when Senator John McCain from Arizona was running for president, against then Senator Barack Obama, John McCain chose Sarah Palin to be his vice president, okay? John McCain was an older man from Arizona, and Sarah Palin was a younger woman from Alaska. Geographically, they're very far apart, right? And, and he's an older guy, and she's a younger gal, right? And so they're very different. Everything about them is different. Um, and so uh, Barack Obama chose uh, Joe Biden as his running mate. Uh, Barack Obama was a younger, uh, um, uh, partially African-American gentleman, and Joe Biden was an, an older uh, 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 Caucasian man and uh, who had more experience, whereas he was kind of the younger, uh, maybe uh, uh, perceived to be as more popular cool guy, and Joe Biden was like the older, uh, more, I guess, seasoned, uh, uh, steady hand, Right. And so he chose somebody who is different than him to run to balance that ticket. And so we uh, people do that all the time when they're running for president. So when President Lincoln ran for his second term, he balanced his ticket as well. And so Lincoln's balanced ticket involved him on his second run for the president, getting somebody who was unlike him to be his vice president. And that person who he chose that was unlike him was Andrew Johnson. And. So, so a couple quick things about Johnson. Uh, similarities first, right? So um, Lincoln and Johnson were both self-made men, okay? Uh, Lincoln came from absolute poverty. Johnson also came from a great deal of poverty, and they both kind of rose their way up to the top, right? Uh, Lincoln came from Illinois, which was a firmly no-slave state, okay? Now, Johnson came from, I believe he came from Tennessee, which had seceded from the Union. Johnson was the only, uh, gosh, I hope I'm remembering this correctly. Johnson was the only senator from a state that left the United States of America to join the Confederacy. He was the only senator from a seceded state that decided to stay on and work with the government of the United States. And he was a Democrat, whereas Lincoln was a Republican. And so Lincoln, wanting to solidly unify the entire country um, because he was winning the war, right, and, uh, and he knew that there would rapidly come a day where, where the North and the South would have to become one nation again, he chose Andrew Johnson because Andrew Johnson was a Democrat from the South who was loyal to the Union. In fact, in fact, Andrew Johnson even owned slaves before all this happened. Okay, and so before the North and the South split up, Andrew Johnson was a slaveholder. Can you believe that? And so, uh, and so Lincoln chose this, this very recently former slaveholder to be his vice presidential running mate. Okay, uh, another quick fact about Johnson, and I know, uh, I feel like I say this about a lot of people during this period of time, but it's definitely true for him. Johnson was a drunkard. He drank a lot. In fact, that's kind of what he was known for. And so, if you're keeping track, kids, Ulysses S. Grant, the general that came after McClellan and, and Ambrose Burnside, uh, so the general that the northern states relied on to win the war, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, was uh, super known for being very drunk most of the time, and Johnson was also known for being incredibly drunk most of the time. And, uh, and, and so this is kind of like a circle of people around Lincoln that are very good at the one job that they have to do. 
but maybe aren't suited for other jobs. Uh, and so, and so Lincoln, uh, he very deftly put together this team, and uh, and because of a lot of the support that Andrew Johnson got for him, he he very uh, handily won his second term in office, beating uh, then General McClellan, who was his his uh, his opponent in the election. Um, so anyway. There is no homework tonight for American history, so that if you have the opportunity, you can watch the movie Lincoln. Tomorrow, we are going to continue talking about Andrew Johnson, and you will actually have kind of an interesting assignment. Tomorrow, you have uh, almost an hour of homework for your U.S. history, so today I'm going to kind of give you a break. All right, so that's it for our current events and for our U.S. history. It's time for us to move on now to literature. Uh, which I recorded at a different time, so I'm going to pop over to that right now. Thank you. Literature friends, this is week three, day one. And you've just read, or finished reading, the entire book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Whew, what a story. This is a classic for many reasons, like we've discussed in class. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea accurately predicted many scientific advancements before they happened. Um, it, um, it, it was a great story, you know. It, it, it has really interesting characters. Um, it is uh, great for its time. It's, it's super, like, important for its time, uh, you know. As, as a piece of literature, it fits perfectly with, like, our historical study of the Civil War because it's, it's from that time frame. And Jules Verne is, is a brilliant writer to the point where, uh, even though this is a, a French story that's been translated and retranslated, it's still so fascinating to read. And so uh, we find ourselves at the end of this book not knowing what happened. Um, some of the best stories ever told leave you with a big question mark and leave you wondering. And so for your homework, um, since I can't rightly give you a test over this book, for your homework, I want you to write me another paper. And so in the past, you wrote me a paper, and in fact, the next couple days, I'm going to be reading those papers, putting them on the internet. I bet you didn't see that one coming, okay? But I want you to write me another paper. And so for literature, for your homework this week, um, I, I want you to get it done before uh, day five this week, um, you are going to write me a paper. And I want it to be at least five paragraphs. Um, you know, you all, you all usually write more than that for me, but that's okay. So we're going to make the paper a five-paragraph minimum paper. And um, uh, in the paper, I want to know what happened in your mind to the Nautilus and Captain Nemo. So a five-paragraph paper explaining what comes next after this story ends for the captain and his crew. Was the Nautilus scuttled in the maelstrom? Was... Uh, did Captain Nemo continue to kind of ravage the seas and, 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 and sink ships? Did, um, did he turn over a new leaf when the three friends got away and realized that his, his search for vengeance was um, not healthy? What happens to the crew? So I want to know all this and more in your five-paragraph essay. Now, as you all very well know, five-paragraph essays need to have uh, introduction, conclusion, and at least three thoughts for your body paragraphs. That all should go without saying, but I'm still saying it. Uh, so your five-paragraph essay on, uh, on, on this is due. Now, uh, Mr. Barbero is going to be making an Apple Classroom uh, assignment, um, but if we are not able to activate the Apple Classroom by the time this, uh, this is due, uh, you can also email it in. Make sure that you're emailing it to the mroll at davincitree.academy as well as the jbarbero at davincitree.academy in order to get your credit. This will count as the final test over the book. Um, I hope you enjoyed the book, and I'll be announcing soon what our next book is. So that is it for literature today. Make sure that you're writing your paper. Be creative. Be fun. I might even be reading them on air. All right. Thanks, guys.
Bye. All right, now it's time for science. Week three, day one. Science time, Mr. O. I'm super stoked. Yes, I'm glad you are super stoked, science student, because today we're talking about weight. Something that I talk about a lot. So, weight is different wherever you go, okay? Your weight is actually a little bit different when you are at the beach than it is when you are on the top of a mountain. Because weight is not, um, it's not a constant, okay? Weight is the measure of gravity, uh, and it's the force that gravity applies to a certain amount of mass. So, when I'm on top of a mountain, I weigh a little bit less, but my mass is constant. When I am at the beach, I weigh a little bit more, but my mass is constant. The mass of myself, okay, like all of this stuff here, doesn't change. But the gravitational force at the beach and the gravitational force on top of a mountain is different. On top of a mountain, I'm further away from the center of the Earth. And so the force of gravity is less strong when I'm on top of a mountain. When I am down at a beach, I am closer to the core of the Earth, and therefore Earth's gravity has a stronger pull on me, and so I weigh a little bit more, okay? So again, weight is the result of the, your mass and the effect that gravity has on pulling you down, okay? So let's read the textbook about this, and then we're going to see a little video that also explains it from the Fuse School. Weight. The force of gravity on a person or object at the surface of a planet is known as weight. When you step on a bathroom scale, you are determining the force with which Earth is pulling you. Do not confuse weight with mass. Weight is a measure of the force of gravity upon an object, and mass is a measure of the amount of matter in the object. Okay, so weight is different than mass. If you go into outer space, your mass is still the same, but your weight almost disappears. Okay? So weight and mass, again, are two totally different things. Whoops. Doo -doo -doo. All right, let's take a look. Since weight is a force, you can rewrite Newton's second law, which we covered last week, of motion. Force, times, uh, force equals mass times acceleration to find weight. So therefore, weight equals mass times acceleration due to gravity. Weight is usually measured in newtons, mass in kilograms, and acceleration due to gravity in meters per second squared, or meters per second per second. Again, this is either meters per second squared or meters per second per second. So a 50 kilogram person weighs 50 kilograms, times 9.8 meters per second squared equals 49 newtons on Earth's surface, okay? So that uh, the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second per second, or ne meters per second squared, we also refer to that usually as 1g. So if you, if you talk about pulling some Gs, like if you're in a spaceship and you're taking off, and you're like, whoa, the G-force is so strong. They're experiencing five Gs right now. That's, that's 9.8 um, uh, meters per second squared times five. Okay, so that measurement of 9.8, uh, I think there's a mosquito on my ankle, 9.8 meters per second squared, that would be considered one G. Okay, uh, and so, Again, the mass times that uh, equals your weight, okay? Acceleration due to gravity. And so the acceleration due to gravity, like I just explained, is different when you're on top of a mountain than when you're at sea level. And so sea level is what we call the level at Earth's surface where the ocean is. Because the ocean is liquid, it's more or less at the same level everywhere around the world. Now that's not exactly true, but it, it's pretty close. And so we... we we consider 1g, or 1, uh, of Earth's gravitational forces to be the uh, gravitational force at sea level, okay? All right, we have a video from the Fuse School that probably explains this a whole heck of a lot better than I just did, so let's watch it. 
When it says 56 oh, kilograms on your bathroom scales, what are you actually measuring? Well, if you said weight, like most people would, then you're sort of wrong. Kilograms are a measure of mass, but the scales actually measure the force of gravity on your mass. So they do actually measure weight, but this should be in units of force, newtons. Confused? Keep watching. This is a one kilogram bag of sugar. Grams and kilograms are units of mass. Mass is a measure of how much stuff is in something. This bag contains twice as much stuff. It has a mass of two kilograms. It would be wrong to say the bag weighed one kilogram or two kilograms, as weight is a force caused by gravity. To measure the weight, we need a spring balance or force meter. This is a force meter or a Newton meter. It shows the weight of something hung from it. Let's add the bag of sugar. It shows the weight is almost 10 Newtons. Can you remember the equation that links mass with weight? Remember F equals MA, where F is force in Newtons, M is mass in kilograms, and A is acceleration in meters per second per second. We can rewrite this a little as W equals mg, where W is weight in newtons, and g is acceleration due to gravity. On Earth, g equals 9.8 meters per second per second. So the weight of the one kilogram bag of sugar is one times 9.8 which equals 9.8 newtons, as the picture shows. Often, in everyday life, we use the word weight, when in fact we mean mass. The bag of sugar has a mass of 1 kilogram, but a weight of 9.8 newtons. Now let's take this bag of sugar to the moon. The moon is much less massive than the Earth, and so has a lower gravity. On the moon, g is only 1.6 meters per second per second. See how the weight has dropped compared to when it was on Earth. But notice, we still have the same amount of sugar. There is still one kilogram of stuff. The weight has changed, but not the mass. Jupiter, the gas giant, has a G value of 25 meters per second per second. Can you work out what the force meter would show for the bag of sugar here, assuming there was a solid surface to stand on, the sugar now has a weight of 25 newtons. But don't forget, we still have one kilogram of sugar. That hasn't changed. Do you remember gravity? Watch this video. An object thrown away from the Earth will experience a force towards the Earth which slows it down, stops it, and the object accelerates back towards the Earth. This acceleration is due to the Earth's gravitational force and is written as a little g. It's also known as the gravitational field strength. To stop the apple falling, so to prevent the gravitational force pulling it towards the center of the Earth, a force is needed that is equal to this gravitational pull. Remember this, and on Earth, G equals 9.81 meters per second per second, or approximately 10 meters per second per second. Okay, back to mass and weight. Remember that mass is a measure of the amount of stuff in an object and gives a measure of how difficult it is to get moving or to stop it. It never changes. For example, my mass on Earth is 56 kilograms. On the Moon, I would still have a mass of 56 kilograms. The acceleration due to the Earth's gravity is measured in meters per second per second, or it can be measured in newtons per kilogram, as it's a force exerted on a unit mass. So let's now use this lovely equation to find my weight. 
Weight is the force due to gravity, and that depends upon the masses of the two objects that are attracted. On Earth, my weight is mass times gravity, so roughly 56 kilograms times 10, which is 560 newtons. But what about on the moon? The gravitational acceleration on the moon is only 1.6 meters per second per second. I hope you got 89.6 newtons. So, you would feel very light on the moon, and if you try to walk, each step would send you leaping away from the surface. See how gravitational field strength changes on the surface of different planets. This is because the planets have different sizes and masses. The largest planet, Jupiter, with the greatest mass, has the highest gravitational field strength. My weight on Jupiter, if there was a solid surface to stand on, would be 1,400 newtons. And bathroom scales, which are calibrated in kilograms, would show I had a mass of 143 kilograms. You would feel very heavy, yet your mass would still be 56 kilograms. Just your weight would be two and a half times more than on Earth. Now for Newton's apple. An apple with a mass of 100 grams is held in your hand to stop it from falling to Earth. What force do I need to prevent it from starting to fall? Take the acceleration due to gravity to be 10 meters per second per second. Pause the video and work this out. So the force is mass m times g, or 0.1 kilograms times 10. So the force of gravity on an apple is about 1 newton. And it was the falling apple that gave Isaac Newton the idea in the first place. How about that? And just remember, our mass always stays the same, but our weight can change. Maybe we should all move to the moon. Is that there? Oh, good. Okay. Whoa. Okay. So, again, your weight changes depending on where you are. Okay. Your mass doesn't change depending on where you are. Uh, unless you maybe go on a diet, then your mass can change. Uh, weight scientifically is calculated in newtons, and mass is calculated with kilograms. Now, it is confusing because colloquially here on Earth, which means like our shorthand here on Earth is that we use pounds and kilograms to measure weight. But in reality, kilograms are, are supposed to be a measure of mass. So today's lesson was on weight. I hope that makes sense. Uh, what we are doing is we're kind of going through each thing one by one and you are completing a handout. So you have a handout from last week. I'll repost the handout. Any questions that you can answer today that you couldn't answer before, please fill those in. And uh, hopefully by the end of the week, you should be able to get the whole thing done. Um, towards the end of the week, we're going to transition uh, from just doing the handout, and you're going to be doing Khan Academy uh, lessons on, on Newton's three laws and all this great stuff. All right, so that's it for science for today. Uh, tomorrow, we are going to talk a little bit about free fall and gravity. Thank you. All right, all right. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Looks like we're good to go. So uh, we are in math class. This is week three, day one, group one. All right, first off, an apology. Um, the class was posted, and I think I was still in the hospital with the baby at the time, and so we did not post the first part of the Khan Academy Pythagorean Theorem links. Uh, so today and tomorrow, we're going to be doing reviews of Pythagorean Theorem. Um, and then you're going to be doing the Khan Academy practice and the lessons. And then the day after that, we're doing irregular shapes. And then we'll have one day of review and we have a take home test for everybody. So that's kind of the schedule for the rest of the week uh, for group one math. All right. So first for Pythagorean theorem, uh, we were talking about it uh, uh, last um, last week, I guess, on week two, day five. The idea is it, it's uh, it's for right triangles. OK. So right triangles, and this is um, this is Pythagorean theorem, pi 
Pythagorean. I think that's spelled right. Theorem. Okay. And this is for right triangles, right triangles only. Okay. And the uh, the formula for it is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay. Whereas a always equals a side. And it doesn't matter what side, it's just any side. Okay. B equals a side. And it doesn't matter what side, it can be any side. Okay. And then C equals the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse. I probably spelled that wrong, but oh well. The hypotenuse is the longest side. Longest side on the right triangle. Okay, so that's a quick review. All right, so let's do an easy one as an example. Okay, so again, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay, and we'll have this triangle right here. Do, 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 just like that. Okay, my little, whoops, come on, man. There we go. Got my little bit of red there. Okay, and so A can be either side. It can be this side over here, or it can be this side over here. It doesn't matter which side, okay? It can be either one. And so, you know, just uh, pick pick which side you want it to be. So I'm going to put A down here. Uh, B can be either side as long as it's not A, and A is already taken on that side. So B can be that side right there. Now, it's important to remember that the hypotenuse is always the longest side. Also, the hypotenuse is always the side that's pointing away from the right angle. So that right angle with the little little box over there, okay, the opposite end of that right angle is always the hypotenuse, and it's always C, okay? I don't know how much it looks like C. There we go. It's always C. There we are, okay? So A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And so uh, if we do something easy here, like let's say, that this is four, let's say this is three right there, and I don't know what C is, okay? Um, again, uh, I just take A squared, which would be four squared. So A squared, which would be four squared, okay? B squared, which you saw over here is three, so take that three squared, it equals C squared, okay? Whatever this is right there, okay? So. Uh, 4 squared, 4 times 4 is 16, plus 3 squared, 3 times 3 equals 9, okay, and that equals C squared, okay, and then 16 plus 9 equals 25, equals C squared, and then I just do a little bit of algebra, and I always put my little line there, okay, and so I have to square root both sides, and remember, a square root will actually cancel out a square. So the square root and the square, they cancel each other out, okay? Now, so I'm left with C on this side, and I have to figure out what the square root of 25 is. Now, if you remember your perfect squares, uh, which we talked about last week, 3 times 3 equals 9. So 9 is a perfect square, which ironically I just circled, okay? 4 times 4 is a perfect square, 16. I'll put a square around it this time. It's less ironic, okay? 5 times 5 equals 25, another perfect square. Oh, dang, we hit it, okay? 25 is a perfect square of 5 times 5. Therefore, the square root of 25 must be 5, okay? All right, so the square root of 25 gives us 5. So C equals 5. So if A is 4, okay, and B is 3, then C must be 5. That's how we use that, uh, that formula, okay? Now, I want to go one level deeper here uh, for a moment. Oops, come on, let's scroll. Um, so sometimes, like when we're doing long division, okay, when we're doing long division, and let's say we have a number that goes on forever. When you first started doing long division, and uh, let's say that you had uh, something like uh, 30 divided by 10. Okay, when you first started doing long division like this and you learned, okay, I put 10 on the outside of the house 
I put 30 on the inside. Okay, oh, this is a bad example. But, um, but basically, when you first started doing long division, you figured out that, okay, I'll do it, and then I get a zero at the end. And because I got a zero at the end, I know that three is my answer. Woohoo! Yay! Okay, so that's when you first started. And then you started getting some, some more difficult problems like this, where it's 33 divided by 10. And you're like, oh, 33 divided by 10. That's a little harder. I put a 33 over here, and I go to 10, and I do this. And I get a 30, and oh no, I have a remainder down here. What the heck? Ah, okay. And then, and then you learned that if you have a remainder, then you put a little remainder three. Okay, that was your next step. Okay, and you learned that it's okay to have a remainder. You learned that that little remainder is okay. Don't be sad. Okay, the the remainder is okay. All right, and so you remember that. All right, then after you learned about remainders, the next step, what you learned about is you probably learned about decimals, okay? So next you learned that you can take 33 divided by 10, and you can do it with a decimal, okay? And then you had 10, 33, you did that, you did that, you got three, and then boom, man, you popped in a decimal there, popped in a decimal there, hooray, okay? And now you got 3.3. And then you were even happier. You're like, hey, I don't have to use remainders. I'm a big boy or girl or non-binary person. And I know how to use decimals now. This is fantastic. I'm, 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 I'm so good at math. And then after that, uh, a teacher came along and was like, yo, sometimes you don't want to use decimals. Sometimes you want to use fractions. And so then you learned how to do fractions. And so you could say 10 goes into 33. Oh, boy, there's 3. There's 30. I do that. And I get... I get instead of 3.3, .3, I get 3 and 3 tenths. Oh, look at that. So I can get 3 and 3 tenths, or I can get 3.3. .3. Either way, they're the same thing, and they're all a little bit like 3 remainder 3. Okay? So, so you went through that whole process when you learned how to do long division, and it was cool. And you learned over time that this is okay, and then you learned that this is okay. All right? And so... Uh, it took some time, but you got there, okay? Today, I want to teach you the next thing that's okay, all right? Last week when we were doing this, I was rounding all of my answers, you know, all right? So I would say something like we would get 35, and we'd say the square root of 35, all right? And so we would have to take it, and we'd say, well, the square root of 35, and we do one of these little things here. And we would say, okay, my perfect squares, I have 2 times 2 equals 4, 3 times 3 equals 9, 4 times 4 equals 16, uh, none of them are close to 35, i got to keep on going, 5 times 5 equals 25, 6 times 6 equals 36. Oh, hold on a second, I can do these two right here are very close. And so you could say, okay, we have the square root of 25, okay, it's less than. Okay, that. And then we have the square root of 36, okay, which is less than that. And then so then you'd have to ask yourself, all right, well, is, um, you know, is, is 35, is it closer to 25 over here or is it closer to 36 over here? And then you'd be like, well, it's obviously closer to 36, okay? And since, uh, since the square root of 36 is 6 and the square root of 25 is 5, and this is closer over here, okay, then you could say to yourself, well, that means that the square root of 35 is about 6, okay? You're like, all right, yay, the square root of 35 is about 6. That's good. I'm estimating. Yay, okay? And so we were doing that last week, and we're like, this is good. It's okay to estimate, all right? Now, I want to tell you that doing estimating for, for, uh, uh, for, for square roots is a lot like doing remainders all the way up here for long division, okay? It's kind of the same, all right? So sometimes estimating makes it quick and easy, all right? But we also have to learn that it's okay. Sometimes it's okay just to leave it as a square root. We don't always have to unroot it, all right? So guys, today in the lesson, the thing that I want to add to the discussion is that it is actually okay to leave it as a square root. 
you don't always have to have a, a, a proper number that's outside of a square root sign. Okay, let's um, let's take an example problem here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to do a triangle here. Okay, and let's say let's say I know what this is. Let's say I know that that's 144. Awesome, very good. Uh, let's also say that I know that this side over here is 50. Okay, and so I want to find out what this side is, and I'm going to call this side B. All right, and so we already know that if this is a right triangle, okay, if this is a right triangle, this side over here is the hypotenuse. It's going to be my C, and going back to our formula, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. All right. Bum, bum, bum. Okay. All right. And so my C squared is going to be uh, 144. Okay. So my C squared is going to be 144 squared. That's going to be a really big number. Okay. Um, and then over here, I know that my A squared is going to be 50 squared, which is also going to be a very big number. Okay. And so I have B right there. <clears throat> okay. And you can't see this right now, but I'm going to cheat really quick because these are very big numbers. And so 144 squared. Okay. 144 times 144 gives me 20,000. 736. I'll, I'll do an example right after this using smaller numbers. Okay. Oh, I forgot my square root of my b. B squared right there. Okay. And then 50 squared. What is that? 2,500. Is that right? Yeah, 2,500. Okay. So <clears throat> I now know. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I don't mean to mess up the audio on this video. Uh, so I know that we have b squared here. And it's 2,500 plus b squared equals uh, 20,736. Now, in order to be a good pre-algebra student here, I know that I have to subtract 2,500 from both sides so I can get my b squared all by itself. Okay, so I'll do that. That cancels that out. So I get b squared equals, what is this? This should be 18,000, right? 18,236. Nice. I did it in the wrong color, but you guys, you guys know what's going on. You all are very smart. So now I have to square root both sides. Okay. Now, for this, this is a really big number. Okay. So this number right here, 18,236 is huge. So this square root gets rid of that. Okay. But 18,236, I'm going to be here for quite a while, figuring out if 18,236 is a perfect square or not. Now, I could cheat and use a calculator, and sometimes I do, and that's okay, because we have calculators with us all the time. When I was a kid, uh, they didn't let us use calculators all the time, because they'd see, like, what happens when you're in the real world and you don't have a calculator? Well, guess what? Everyone has a calculator now. It's called the cell phone, right? But when we're doing math, uh, if we want to just say that B equals this number, that is totally acceptable. B equals the, the square root of 18,236. That is an acceptable answer. This is okay. You can do this. Yay, big smiley face. Okay. And so um, you still have to remember the, the, the perfect squares. Definitely, definitely, definitely remember your perfect squares 1 through 12, okay? 1 through 12, that, that should be pretty straightforward, okay? Uh, of course, you have, whoops, no, <laughs> we have 4, just as I start preaching perfect squares and I get the first one wrong. So we have, again, we have 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, that's uh, 6 times 6, uh, 7 times 7, we have 42, or 40. <laughs> What am I doing? It's 49. Ah, that's, it is very late. You, you don't know that right now, but it is, uh, it is late. 8 times 8 is 64. 9 times 9, 81. Okay. 10 times 10, 100. 11 times 11, 121. 12 times 12, 144. Okay. So these numbers, these perfect squares, you really ought to know. 
If you want to go one more up and say, well, okay, uh, 13 times 13 is 169, that's okay too. All right, you can you can definitely, 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 you know, go up there. You can even go up to 14 if you really wanted, but um, yeah, that's up to you. These are all like need to know. Okay, you need to know these. Now, when your answer gets way outside of this range, though, uh, you can either use a calculator or you can just leave it again as a square root. Okay. All right, let's do a problem that's not so insanely high. Okay, so. Let me change my triangle. So I flipped it around like this, okay? My right angle is gonna be right there. If my right angle is right there, I know my hypotenuse is on the other side. So this long side is gonna be C, excellent. And again, my formula is A squared plus B squared equals C squared, great, okay? All right, and uh, let's see, what number should we use? Um, let's say that this side is nine, and let's say that this side is, 13. Okay, so if we have 9 and 13, we don't know what A is. We have to figure out what A is. Okay, so let's do it. So we don't know what A is. So we have A squared plus, so this is going to be our B over here because it's one of the shorter sides. Okay, so A squared plus 9 squared equals, and this is going to be C because it's the hypotenuse, equals 13 squared, just like that. And I'm going to draw my little line of fairness there. So my algebra is always nice and neat. So next I have a squared plus 9 times 9 is 81. Great. 13 times 13, like we just said, is 169. Great. Okay. Now I have to isolate my a. In order to do that, I have to get a alone on one side. I have to subtract 81 from both sides. Remember what I do on one side of my yellow wall of fairness, I have to do on the other. That cancels out. I'm left with a squared on my left, okay? On this side, let's see here, nine, take away one is eight. I have to do a little borrowing here, so I get uh, a squared equals 88. Next up, I have to square root both of them, okay? And so on this side, the square root cancels out the square, hooray, okay? And on the other side, 88 is not a perfect square. So A equals the square root of 88, like so, okay? So again, A equals square root of 88, B equals 9, and C equals 13, and that's okay. That's all my answers right there. And so that is a little bit of an addition, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat is really messed up right now, on doing Pythagorean theorem. And so today uh, I want you to watch, I think it's the first two videos and then do the first uh, little practice problems on Pythagorean theorem. And tomorrow we're gonna, I'm gonna review this again and we're gonna take it another step. All right, thank you everybody. All right, I believe this is recording. So uh, group two, we're in week three and day one and we are finishing up the basics basics on solving systems of equations. Okay, basics on solving systems of equations. So I gave you guys two worksheets last week and you know, now that I think about it, I haven't gotten any of those worksheets back, which is really weird because I know that at least, at the very least, usually someone like Aiden or, or, or Hazel or someone is, is turning them in, even when no one else says, you know what, I think I might have messed up. Oy. Okay, I'll, after I'm done with this video, I'll go back and, and double check and make sure that I attach them. Um, uh, today, I just wanted to, again, review. Uh, so we have four basic methods for doing these problems. One, plug and chug or guess and check. I guess it's the more polite way to say it, guess and check. Okay. I do not recommend this for most, not recommended. Every now and again, you'll find a rare one where you're just like, yeah, just try it, right? But for, for the most part, that's not a super scientific way to do this, okay? The next way, number two, is graphing, which is one of my favorites, especially if you have a graphing calculator, it makes life easy, okay? Number three, I just realized if I didn't assign those to you, 
this is like the most boring time travel thing you've ever experienced because I'm going to put an intro before this. All right, whatever. Okay, number two is graphing. Number three, uh, to solve the system of equations, we can do the elimination method. The elimination method in some books or some math teachers, they call it the combination method because we're combining combination, the different things. Okay, and then finally, we have the substitution method. Okay, and so these are the various methods that we have in order to solve one of uh, these problems, and it's always going to be uh, one of these that we use or a, a kind of like a combination of these. Okay, I want to do one practice problem. Uh, I think I said earlier on in the lesson, I'm trying to keep these a little bit shorter because we have a lot of people who are falling behind, and I want to give you guys a chance to catch up. I know some of you, actually, your parents have reached out to me and let me know that uh, you weren't doing something right, and so you're trying to catch up, and I totally understand that this week is kind of our catch-up week, okay? All right, let me find a good example system for us to solve. Um, cool, okay. Uh, let's do this one. Okay, I'm going to do two examples with you, actually. Okay, so here's example. That's a gross-looking E, but it's example number one. Okay, our system of equations is going to be negative or 3x plus 2y equals 6, and then y equals 1. Just like that. Whoops. I said 1, and then I wrote 6. Very clever. Okay. y equals 1. Okay. As you all know, I have to have the bracket here, so it indicates a system. And again, I have any of these methods. Okay. I can guess, I can graph, I can eliminate, I can substitute. Okay. Now for this one, since y equals 1, I'm going to choose substitution. Substitution just seems really, really easy since I already know that y equals 1 because of this guy right over there. So if y equals 1, I can simply plug in 1 for y in the top equation, and I can solve very quickly. Okay, so let's do exactly that. Okay, so I have negative 3x plus 2, because 2 times 1 is 2, equals 6. I subtract my 2 from both sides. That cancels out there. Negative 3x equals 4. I divide both sides by a negative 3. The negative 3 and the negative 3 cancel out because a, and it gives me x since a negative times a negative is a positive. And so x equals negative 1 and 1 third. Done. Okay. All right. So y equals 1. x equals negative 1 and 1 third. Easy peasy. Okay. That was an easy example using substitution. Okay, let's go to example number two, and then I will leave you to your homework. Example number two. Um, let's see here. Let me choose one that is harder, but uh, not crazy. Let's see. Ah, okay. No, that's a little too hard. Ooh, that one just looks fun. I don't care if it's a little hard. Okay, let's say 9x take away 5y equals 45. Sorry, algebra class. I'm actually looking in your book on page 372. Uh, if you are in my math class, I am on your math book, page 372, and I'm looking at question number 29. And if you are in my math class, you also know that I actually don't have a key for this book. We always have to work out all the answers, you guys and myself and Mr. Barbera. So it keeps us all honest. So you can never say that, oh, Mr. Barbero and Mr. Roll are just like faking. They don't actually know how to do this. When the truth is, we don't know how to do it. <laughs> so we always mess up in front of you. Okay. Um, all right. I have on the top, I have a 9x. I have a negative 5y. Let's see here. Is there anything easy that I can just knock out? So there's nothing really easy that I can knock out with elimination because I have a 9 there and a 2 there. Right, and so nine and two, it's it's kind of hard to, to to combine those. Okay, I have a five here and a twenty-one there, and so those aren't easily combined either. So elimination's not really there. Substitution, I guess I could. Right, I, I, you know, you could do any of these, 
but substitution looks a little bit harder here. All right, let's do it. I'm going to graph these. Okay, let's graph these. So in order to graph them first, I'm going to convert them into y equals mx plus b. So I'm going to do that one over here, and I'm going to take this one over here, and let's work on converting these into y equals mx plus b, and then we can graph it together. Okay, minus take away 5y, and of course I'm going to use my graphing calculator because that's just fun. Why not, right? my little line here, do my little line here. Okay, did I recopy them correctly? It looks like I did, okay? All right, so I'm trying to isolate my Y, get my Y alone. And in order to do that, um, on this side, I'm gonna add 2X, add 2X, great. So that leaves me negative 21 Y equals 2X take away 10. All right, that's a 21 there. Okay, I'm gonna gonna divide both sides. Ooh, this is gonna get pretty ugly. Okay, so that cancels that out. So the negative 21 is gone. But then I get a y equals. Uh, let's see here, negative 2 over 21 x. Okay, and so that's there. Okay, so that's there. But then I have to do that too. So negative 10 divided by a negative 21. A negative divided by a negative gives me a positive. Oops. So it's going to be plus. So negative 2 over 21x plus, well, I guess you can't reduce that. So it's just going to be plus 10 over 21. Okay, that works. Okay, so that's, that's my first problem. Let's look at the second one here. All right, so I have to take away a 9x starting off at the top. That cancels that out. That gives me negative 5y equals negative 9x plus 45. That works. Okay. Uh, I have to divide both sides by negative 5. That takes that out. Good. Negative 5 over here. And again, recall, I got to do both sides there and there. Okay. All right. So y equals, so I have a negative 9x divided by a negative 5, and a negative divided by a negative gives me a positive. So I'm going to leave it as an improper fraction because it's a rise over run if I were actually graphing this out myself. So I get a positive 9 over 5x, and then we have a positive 45 divided by a negative 5, so it's going to be a negative because it's a positive divided by a negative. And then 5 uh, goes into 45 nine times, okay? So the top equation turns into y equals negative 2, uh, I'm sorry, y equals negative 2 over 21x plus 10 over 21. And the bottom equation gives me y equals 9 fifths x take away 9, all right? So these are my little magic equations there. Okay, now I have to go find my calculator. Where are you at, calculator? There you are, graphing calc. Graphing calculator, we love you. You make our life so easy. Not like when Mr. Roll was a kid and we had to use TI-83s. Is that Pokemon? That is Pokemon. Looks like my kids have been using this. Okay. So the top equation, y equals negative 2 over 21x plus 10 over 21. All right, I've got to be careful putting this in because it's easy to mess up. y equals, uh, let's get some negatives in parentheses, 2 over 21. I can't see it, but I know it's there. x, whoops, do I want it in the parentheses? No, I don't. Try to get it outside the parentheses. You guys see there, it's really hard to see. I guess hopefully you can still see it. And what was it? It was y equals negative 2 over 21x plus 10 over 21. Okay, so it's actually an addition sign, not a subtraction sign. Plus parentheses 10 over 21. All right, let's see how that looks. Okay graph. Okay, I get 2 over 21x, 10 over 21. Okay, what do we got? Oof, oof. I mean, that feels kind of right, though, doesn't it? Because 
if I have a slope of negative 2 over 21, it is negative, but it's going negative at a really slow rate. And it crosses the y-axis at just under a half. Okay, so, okay, that feels right. Okay, let's jump over. All right, so my other equation is y equals uh, 9 fifths x take away 9. Okay, y equals, uh, parentheses, 9 fifths x, oh, come on, get out of my parentheses there, x, take away, was it 9, right, 9 fifths x take away 9, yep, okay, perfect, all right, graph that, all right, so I got my orange line there and my green line here. Okay, that looks good, that looks good, and boom, they intersect at 5, 0. So if I go back, the system of equations over here, uh, the answer is 5, 0. And remember, it's an ordered pair, so it's always x, then a y. And so x equals 5, y equals 0, and I'm done. That's the answer. All right, so... Go ahead and check the link on the page, whatever homework's up there. Go ahead and do that. And this was your review of how to solve a system of equations. Hopefully it was helpful. Thank you much. Have a good one. Oh, and this is your last class, so bye.